Here I have my two bestest fertility experts here on <laughs> diet Terry needs, okay? So this is a husband and wife couple who I love dearly, and this is Dr. Um, Zainab Iraz and Dr. Alan Gu, and they're naturopathic doctors, and maybe you could tell a little bit about yourselves very quickly, because mm -hmm. we want to get into the meat of this. Yeah, we're both uh, faculty members at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. Our uh, clinical practices uh, are working with patients who are trying to grow their families and uh, we're in the process of conducting and publishing research as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And that's why we're here by the way because um, we're at the Canadian Fertility Andrology Society and it was so awesome to hear them speak because they also work at a live holistic health clinic and it was my first time having the honor to hear you guys speak. Fabulous speakers but it was like a 45 minute talk and we're gonna like make it really small into like five, 10 minutes, all right? So let's, let's hear what you got to say. Yeah, okay, cool. So why don't we look at the uh, dietary patterns and the ones that have been shown to be most uh, useful, most uh, successful. So um, there are a number of different dietary patterns that have evidence for um, helping uh, people conceive, uh, but there's one study in 2019 that compared the top four and it compared the Mediterranean diet, the fertility diet, the alternate uh, healthy eating uh, index diet and the pro-fertility diet. Long story short, the two top ones that came up on top were the Mediterranean diet and the pro-fertility diet. So uh, what did these two diets have in, in common? So they both focus on um, protein coming from vegetable sources. Um, they focus on fish as a source of protein instead of other uh, meat sources. Um, it also focused on um, uh, whole grains and low glycemic uh, carbohydrates and uh, and then between the there was some differences between the pro-fertility diet and the Mediterranean diet and the pro-fertility diet actually uh, scored better in this study and so the, the main differences between those ones are that the fruits and vegetables that were emphasized in the pro-fertility diet were low pesticide fruits and vegetables and also try to have less high high pesticide fruits uh, and vegetables and you can check the uh, environmental working groups clean 15 and dirty dozen for those because um, they correlate well the other thing is they're focused on four other things uh, getting extra folic acid extra b12 extra vitamin d and also extra consumption of soy and actually uh, Zainab will talk to you guys a little bit about soy yeah I will I will I'm gonna actually borrow these so that I have recall but basically when you look at so soy first of all soy and flax are the two uh, greatest sources of dietary phytoestrogens by far amongst all other foods that's not including some of the herbs and plants um, that also have high levels of, of phytoestrogens mm, when you look at preconception data we see that so can a cohort of people who are just starting to try to get pregnant uh, the consumption of soy doesn't really seem to have an impact on how long it takes for them to get pregnant, but flax does seem to have a beneficial effect in that specific population. However, when you look at the data around soy consumption during IUI and IVF cycles, there's a bit of a different story that emerges. Uh, first of all, soy during IUI might have a really specific um, benefit, especially if you're undergoing a cycle with Clomid, which is not really something that happens so much anymore. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave that off to the side for now. But I really want to talk about the impact of soy on uh, women undergoing IVF cycles or individuals undergoing IVF cycles. So basically there's two, uh, two large studies in this area. Uh, the first looks at it's just a prospective study, so following women along who are about to undergo IVF, uh, about 300 women going through 520 IVF cycles. And what they found is that those who consumed the most amount of soy had the highest number of live births. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, and live births is so such a great metric because most studies don't look at live births. They look at clinical pregnancy rates or um, you know, so they look for a heartbeat on an ultrasound at six or seven weeks, but this is a live baby, take home baby. So that's really the best measure of a successful uh, study. And the other great thing is the people who ate the most soy only really ate half a serving a day, which is really quite manageable. It's about, you know, like half a cup of edamame, um, 
half a cup of tofu or tempeh um, and I, don't, I actually don't know what the exact equivalent of soy milk would be. Yeah, it's one, it was, so one serving is one cup Yeah. and so okay. half a cup. Um, would be half a serving. Yeah. And then also uh, just to add to that, so in the pro-fertility diet, in the highest consumption group, um, which was associated with the best chances for live birth, mm -hmm. the highest quartile was just uh, a quarter, basically a quarter serving of soy or more. So if you're getting half a serving in, then that's a really great start. Yeah. So then the only thing to add, though, in terms of you know the genetically modified soy, soy. so we're not talking about that. We're talking no, straight up soy. So genetically modified soy or soy that's not organic does tend to be genetically modified. So what we recommend is just trying to find organic soy products. But luckily, organic soy products are pretty easy yes. to find, mm -hmm. and they're not. Uh, Prohibitively, in, uh, prohibitively expensive. No, especially no. if you get it frozen. Yeah, and yeah. that makes it like really quite easy to get and but, use. Yeah, and even in Chinese supermarkets, you can get it now too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? like get it everywhere. Uh, you can get it yeah. everywhere. So that's great. And I want to add in. So that was an awesome surprise. Yeah, right? I, I, you said something about soy protecting one. Yeah, so I want you to so talk about that. that. That's I think so fascinating. Yeah. Um, we see this, we saw this quite a lot in mouse studies for a long time. So why is it that some mice have a negative effect when they're given BPA on the reproductive system and others didn't? And that was a big question mark for a long time, but it turns out that mice have different types of feed and in the mice that were fed soy as part of their feed, they suffered less detrimental effects of BPA on the reproductive system. Tell versus people what BPA is. The, versus the, the mice that were not fed soy in their feed. Mm -hmm. BPA is bisphenol A. I think most people know it's an endocrine disrupting chemical. Um, it lo also, like soy, looks like estrogen and can bind at the estrogen receptors in the reproductive tract. I didn't... Can someone read that? that um, okay. okay. Um, so, so long. So this this other study actually uh, is quite fascinating. I think it's the most it was in humans this time. The most fascinating story around soy really is that we think it helps in a lot of ways by protecting uh, the all of the body parts that have estrogen receptors from harmful chemicals like BPA. So they looked at a what was the size? Uh, a large cohort 239 women undergoing 347 IVF cycles and they did a pretty thorough investigation they took two urine samples before IVF and they also got some dietary data from them and what they found is that in all of the women who did not consume soy the amount of urine BPA or the amount of BPA in their urine was directly correlated to uh, their IVF outcome. So the women with the most BPA had the worst outcome, 17% live birth rate, versus those with the least BPA, which had 54% live birth. Um, however, when you looked at when they looked at women who consumed soy, what they found was that it didn't matter what their urine BPA was. They had about the same uh, live birth rates, and it was much higher than the 17%, which was the lowest live birth rate for those. Uh, in the high BPA group. So um, all that to say, we think that soy helps protect the reproductive system from the harmful endocrine disrupting chemicals and can have a significant impact on live birth rate and reproductive success. Like, wow, right? Isn't that a great thing? Mm -hmm. Now everyone's gonna be eating edamames every single day. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people ask us about that because they're, they're worried. Yeah, for sure. And, and then, so the other, uh, is there more? Because I want to actually no. go back to your, your diet piece. <laughs> No, no, no more no. soy. It's uh, no more soy. More to soy, but no more soy. Right, no more soy. Right, so, yeah. <laughs> um, back to the piece about you know people eating fish yeah. and the worries about toxicity, mercury, right? Yeah, yeah. So notes. yeah, so um, there are studies, including uh, embryo studies, studies on seeing what kinds of foods, um, if they have an effect on the likelihood of getting to a blastocyst stage. And they found that highest consumption of fish um, was associated with a higher likelihood of reaching blastocyst um, stage. So the question is about mercury and is that a harmful thing? And uh, the authors of the study um, feel that the benefits from the fish outweigh the harms uh, because of the results that they saw. Also, um, you can mitigate that risk by having fish that is higher in omega-3s um, and lower in the mercury and and so there's a lot of sites online that you can take a look at so look at high omega-3 
low mercury fish and fish like sardines, anchovies, and so on and so forth, salmon come up a lot. So take a quick look at that and pretty easy to find. So then one last question, because some people are vegans or vegetarians mm -hmm. or, or they just hate fish. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. We talk about the potential benefits of fish um, and omega-3 fatty acids. It's really hard to get high levels of omega-3s from vegetable sources. Mm -hmm. The body is just not efficient at converting those, oh, though, that type of um, omega-3 fatty acid. So we have a discussion around using fish, if that's a possibility, from as fish oil. If not, we make do with alternate sources like algae oil and things like that. All right, so that's it. There you mm -hmm. have it, guys. It's not awesome information. So here's the thing. This is like a quick little tidbit. So if you want to get in touch with Dr. Yuraz or Dr. Ryu, please do so. You can contact them through a live holistic health clinic because this is what we're posting on right now. Yeah. But they're also found at Dr. Hannum's clinic at the Hannum Fertility Center. And um, you're going to be presenting a poster at the Canadian Fertility Andrology Society. We're having great fun listening to all these awesome talks by the yeah, way and, and it's very yeah, yeah. highly information like great information and tomorrow i'm actually going to do another um, interview live which i normally don't do two days in a row but i will just because we're here and we're going to take advantage of it and again for those who uh, are just joining us for the first time thank you so much for being here share like do whatever you need <laughs> to do uh, get this information out because i think it's so important right and uh, important to get the right sources of information and mm. this is current this is accurate so please share and uh, like the post and, uh, and reach out if you have any questions yeah, yeah. okay sure. and um, if, if you do, don't have pathways to pregnancy definitely pick that up <laughs> for inspiration and hope and we'll see you next time take care bye bye <laughs>